Well, thanks again for, for coming tonight. I'm really happy to be here. In fact, this is probably one of my favorite talks, and I think the reason why is I'm going to summarize in the next 30 minutes or so some of the most compelling evidences that shifted me from an undeclared Christian on origins, not knowing if earth was old or young or whatever it was, into where I am now, which is Stanley standing with my feet firmly planted on the word of God regarding Genesis 1 to 11 as real history. Uh, tonight I'm going to be summarizing a lot of evidence that comes from our flood video. Uh, this flood video, we took about a year and did research. We interviewed some of the leading experts around the world uh, that probably will ever live about this topic. In fact, Dr. Jim Bump Gardner, not to pull out only him, but just by way of example, when I met with him with, with Dave in San Diego and I said, hey, what about this in the flood? And I was drawn up on the whiteboard and going over some of my novel ideas and everything about the flood. When I had the humility to sit down and be tutored by this, uh, by, by John, he pulled up a globe and said, son, I got my PhD in geophysics from UCLA 40 years ago, and I've been studying the flood ever since. He's got some amazing detailed uh, information about the flood. It wasn't just him. It was Dr. Schnelling from Answers in Genesis, Dr. Clary from ICR, several others helped us produce this film that is now growing on almost 3 million views on YouTube. And then after that, we did a follow-up video called Noah's Flood in North America. And that's a shorter video. We just focus on what was happening on North America during Noah's Flood, which happened about 4,400 years ago. And tonight, I want to say that my viewpoint is that we're dealing with a book that's got divine inspiration, the, the, the Bible. It happens to be the longest account of any single event in God's Word. It's about three chapters long was written uh, by God through man, and we have to realize that God is an omniscient or all-knowing writer with an omnipresent or everywhere at once perspective on what happened on earth during the flood. So God can say things in the text through people like, on the same day, all the fountains of the great deep burst forth. That requires a worldwide perspective of what's going on during the flood. So God can say that the flood has all kinds of dates, durations, and players that are given in the account. And it starts out like this. I, most biblical creationists and evolutionists agree that earth at one point in the past, they would say millions of years ago, we would say about 6,000 years ago when God put it there, was configured where all the continents were together. Some people have a version of what they call Rodinia on that. Some people have a Pangea perspective on that. But the Psalms is very clear. It says, in his hand are the deep places of the earth. The strength of the, the hills is his also. The sea is his, and he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. So if Psalms says his hand formed the dry land, you have to ask, well, when did that happen? Genesis 1 says this, and God said, let the waters under the heaven be gathered together unto one place, and let the dry land appear, and it was so. And God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters he called his seas. And God saw that it was good. So you can infer from that verse that there's one massive land continent, and then there's one, the, the rest of the, everything outside of that one land continent are the seas. And this would certainly make it easier for Adam and Eve and the families that followed to do what God commanded, to, uh, to rule over the whole, whole earth and to take dominion over the earth, the creatures, the garden, the fruits, vegetables, the whole thing, because it was all on one big continent, one big landmass. It wasn't spread out. It would certainly it'd be easier for them to take dominion over the earth if it was configured like that. Here's a couple of key flood verses I want us to focus on. The one I just mentioned where the Bible says on the same day where all the fountains of the great deep burst forth or opened up. The Hebrew there is the idea of a breaching or a cleaving, so water coming up from these linear rifts. And the windows of heaven were opened. So the, the, the key here is the flood started on the ocean floor. Very interesting to, to think about because we're going to show how the oceanic rift system supports that. The other verse is that the flood peaked, or the flood zenith, um, 15 cubits upward, which is about 22 feet to the waters prevail, and the mountains were covered. 
So here we have, just from these two scriptures, something starting on the bottom of the ocean that ended up with something ending at the top of the highest hills under heaven. So it was a top-to-bottom process involving the world. It was a worldwide event. And then Genesis 8 says, and the waters receded continually from the earth. It has the idea of an epping and flowing or receding continually from the earth. And on the end of the 150 days, the waters decreased. And the ark rested on the seventh month, the 17th day of the month, on the mountains of Ararat. It does not say the mountain of Ararat. It says on the mountains of Ararat. And the waters decreased continually until the 10th month. In the 10th month, on the first day of the month, the tops of the mountains were seen. So we have a 371-day flood process, and we can connect these two verses saying something started on the ocean floor. It was so significant it raised up to cover the highest hills over under heaven. So one way of viewing it, there are different perspectives on this based upon the Hebrew, but the, the position that's uh, pretty straightforward to take as the waters increase for 150 days, zenith, then after that you have 150 days of the water declining, then earth dried out for about 70 days. Uh, some people would put the zenith of the flood at day 40 uh, for reasons that they have uh, uh, for, for, for doing that. But it was at least a one year process, about 371 days. When did it happen? Well, if you follow the Masoretic text, about 2300 BC. Uh, some people, based upon the, the dates of Abraham, would change it a little bit to maybe 2518 BC. And if you follow the Septuagint, which has a, an earth that was about 7800 years old, you can put the flood about 3168 BC. And some would argue that that better encapsulates some of the Egyptian chronologies. But the flood definitely happened within that bracket, and it happened no no earlier than 3168 uh, date. And here's an article if you want to drill deeper into that. Uh, but it's certainly easy just to take the very straightforward flood date of 2350 or so. And I found it real interesting. I, I've spent a lot of times looking at different mythological flood accounts from the ancient Near East. Uh, I'm, I'm friends with Dr. Price with Liberty University, who's an expert in these tablets. And I find it fascinating that we have things like the Eridu tablet, the Sumerian King's List, the Enuma Elish, the Atrahasis, the Simmons Ark tablet, Gilgamesh. There's several different Babylonian flood myths. And look at that, they all have origins where we believe the flood quit around the mountains of Ararat and the Mediterranean over there. And we, of course, believe that the Bible's account of the flood is the original account that was spun off and changed by all of the other ancient Near East accounts that came after that because there's a ton of overlap and similarities between all these different accounts. But the Bible is the only one that makes rational sense. It would stand up to the, the tests of history that we can put to it. So the eight common elements you'll find uh, when you compare the flood account of the Bible to a lot of these ancient Near Eastern texts are things like they all have in common a punishment or the idea that the God or gods is bringing judgment. There's usually one chosen person to be on the ark heading things up or a saved family. Uh, the animals are saved. We've got vessels that have specifications given. Uh, we have the survival of the flood, the birds find dry land, and there's a sacrifice to God or gods afterwards. They all draw from a lot of the same themes and overtones, but the Bible's the only one that makes sense because if you look at what happens with truth over time, is truth can sometimes get more mythical, but you're not going to have a myth become more truthful. That's the way that you, one way that you can distinguish the biblical account from all these other Babylonian flood myths because you have things like this. You've got the biblical flood says, well, you know, Noah probably had between 55 and 75 years to build the ark with lots of help uh, from his family. It was probably it was between 450 and 515 feet long. It had to survive in the water for 371 days, and it was seaworthy. If you compare that with, for example, the Epic of Gilgamesh Ark, it took him a week to build it. It was 200 feet square on each side. It was only in the water for a week, and it was not seaworthy by anyone's imagination. When you compare that to the dimensions and the shape of the ark, which had been rigorously tested at the Chrysos Center uh, in, in Korea, it was a world-class test center. 
we've learned that the 12 different possibilities of proportions and dimensions to build the ark, it just so happens that the instructions that God himself gave to Noah built an ark that was in fact seaworthy. There is a, a scale that nautical experts use to gauge different storm levels. They're looking at the ocean swells and the wind and the gale and things like this. Uh, we hired a nautical maritime expert team, some engineers, to do a simulation between the biblical ark and the ark of Gilgamesh and found that there's no way that the ark of Gilgamesh could have survived. It would have toppled and turned when you roll up that Buford scale. It would have flopped around. There's seven stories of animals in there that would have been all upsided on each other. Whereas the biblical ark could withstand up to the top level of the Buford scale. Some people would say up to 100 foot swells. It didn't have to go anywhere. It just had to stay there and had to stay upright. And that's what we believe the biblical ark uh, could have done. When it gets into the mechanics of Noah's, uh, Noah's flood, uh, in the early 1990s, there were these six individuals that came together and framed a theory based upon a lot of their studies that had led them all to this culminating point of understanding a, t a theory that describes the mechanics of the flood that has now become known as catastrophic plate tectonics. And this is by far the leading biblical creationist view on how the flood unfolded. We have an animation here that's showing that there was that one Pangea-like configuration that was rapidly split apart. Uh, this is from Scotese on the internet. This is one that follows the evolutionary timing. Uh, but the process is the same. We believe it was sped up. They have this over, I believe, oh, 150 million years or so on the animation you just watched. But biblical creationists believe that that actually ha happened at walking speed. Uh, happened over a year-long flood process. One of the leading experts that have helped frame this theory uh, was Dr. John Bum Gardner. He was a scientist with Los Alamos National Laboratory. He's currently over at uh, Liberty University. Uh, he came up with a program called Terra. It's a scientific software program where he broke up the earth into, I believe, 360,000 different grids and looked at what he called runaway catastrophism or, or runaway subduction, where you have Earth splitting away from that Pangea configuration. The Mid-Atlantic Rift splits all the linear rifting around the Earth, 40,000 mile network of oceanic rift begins opening up during Noah's flood. And then he's got simulations showing what it would have looked like. Uh, here's a report from US News and World Report calling uh, John, a scientist who embraces plate tectonics and Noah's flood, the geophysics of God, and they called him a, 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 re a renowned expert. So here is a quick uh, animation showing a lot of Dr. Bumgardner's work. He was actually able to plot this out during all 371 days of the flood, showing that as the oceanic rifting was happening and new seafloor was being created, that seafloor was being subducted and recycled underneath the land masses at a rate that was very, very fast. We can see here Noah's flood, day 10, 20, 30, 40, how the continents are moving back and forth. He was able to model all of this using geology and earth history and a lot of physics and able to show how the continents could have split apart with what he calls runaway subduction. Today we have the leftovers of the remnant of that subduction where over 90% of, of today's earthquakes are generated by slips at these subduction zones. So we still have these subduction zones. You can see here the ring of fire that goes around all these different continents where they, we still have the new seafloor being bound to the land continents and then released at the same time and slipping. Uh, and we have uh, a lot of earthquakes today are produced by this. Here's one from uh, the 1700s. Uh, I'll show that next, but here's what the making of a tsunami uh, can look like. So we have the, the, the sea floor, the oceanic plate being subducted underneath the land continent there. And when it binds, it bends back, there's a bunch of tension, and then it releases. And when it releases, it sends out a bi-directional tsunami, and this was happening in cycling waves during the flood, and that's why we have so many stratified layers of mud and sediment and dead creatures, marine life that's buried with land creatures, all together because this, this system 
of binding and releasing was happening rapidly as the seafloor subducted at about five miles per hour during Noah's flood. And a quick video shows what happened in the 1700s where there was a, a subduction related tsunami that came over and, and hit Washington and it left these three different very, very controlled distinct strata layers that you can still see in the soil and that happened in 1700. In 2011, we have the same type of thing happening in, in Japan where there was a binding between the seafloor and the landmass. It slipped, moved several feet actually, and caused a, direction, a directional tsunami to go out in both direction, uh, directions, creating all of the havoc that we saw, we all watched on the news. The next evidence I found really interesting is on fossil correlation. Uh, we can know if we look at the different continents and, and study them, there are places where animals and biology uh, and, and herbs and plants are along the same regions of what used to be Pangaea, but when it was broken apart, we can see that they still strata, straddle those same areas. Uh, in fact, it gets really detailed when you start looking at the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, uh, where we have here, you can see that huge 10,000 mile rift. These circles are fossils of certain types of organisms that used to be together. They were living. The fountains of the great deep burst open, linear rift rifting happened, pulled these continents apart, and were able to correlate the same types of biostratigraphy and, and animals and plants are at the same sides on each shelf of these different continents that used to be there living at the same time, but were rapidly split apart, and they're now both buried in mud. How would you do that? It has to be done catastrophically. They're found buried in the very, very mud that killed them. Uh, here's what the Mid-Atlantic Ridge looks like when you look at it uh, from a bathymetric map. It's a 10,000 mile split that goes all the way down the continents as seen there and it actually has sloped ridges to it. So it was happening quickly, sliding these continents apart that are now thousands of miles apart. And when you look at North America, it was what's called the Farallon Plate, which is what subducted as new ocean floor was being created. It was pushed up against the west coast of America and rapidly subducted. And when it was doing that, it was carrying along with it several oceanic plateaus or sea mount form, for formations, volcanic sea mount formations that while they were pulled underneath the continent, wreaked havoc in the middle of America, creating a 13 state kill zone of the dinosaurs. Um, and there was a lot of volcanism rapid, uh, that was due to these rapidly subducting plates. As I mentioned in my earlier talk, that these dinosaurs in the middle of America aren't just buried in mud, they're not just buried in sand, they're buried in mud, sand, and ash. And the ash was due from the volcanic, the volcanics that were involved when the rapid subducting was happening underneath the continent. So here is an animation. You can see the rapid seafloor subducting, the volcanic activities coming up, spouting forth uh, new volcanics, all, all the, the ash is falling, the Independence Dyke Swarm, which is now in LA, split open. It's a 370 mile rift produced tons of ash, unimaginable amounts of ash during the subduction process. And that's why the dinosaurs to this day, over half of America, are buried in the very ash that was involved in their demise. You can go to these different places around the Midwest and still find this ash today. And geologists admit, yeah, it came from California. It was blown over and there was so, so much of it. So after the flood, we have declining subduction-related volcanism. So the Independence Dyke Swarm was a huge volcano that was on the, the, the southern part of California that brought over enough ash to cover about half of America. And then after that, we had several other volcanoes that waned in the extent. So we have uh, the, the Long Valley eruption, the Crater Rake eruption, we have the Mount St. Helens. So when this process was happening, we had the big one first, the Independence Dyke Swarm, then after, and the tailing end phases of the flood and other ones, we had volcanic, other volcanic eruptions that systematically started declining in strength and the amount of ash being produced as the declining plate, the, the ocean plate went down, down, and down, and it started waning back. And all the way, we get to the more recent one of Mount St. Helens, not the most recent one, but the earlier eruptions of Mount St. Helens. 
So they were just declining. And th this really shows we had something drastic at first, which Tim Clary from ICR would call during the Zuni formation or the Zuni mega sequence, which is the top of when the, 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 the worst happened, the worst of everything happened during the, in the flood to the dinosaurs, wiped them all out, finally overran the dinosaur peninsula that they were making their last stand on and buried them all. It was these, these consistent subsequent eruptions that were burying them in ash, sand, and mud. That's why when you go to places like in the middle of Utah or Wyoming, you find these creatures are buried in a matrix of all three of those materials. You've got mud, ash, and sand. And this happened in stages. The Jurassic stage or the, gra the, the Jurassic uh, area was buried first, followed by the Cretaceous. We can see all these circles or giant fossil beds. Uh, caused the Morrison Formation, which is this huge 13-state region, over 700,000 square miles where marine life and land creatures are buried together. 141 massive bone beds with millions upon millions of animals all buried together, and only about 75% of it, or 25% is exposed, 75% is still buried, so some massive catastrophe happened in this region. And the dinosaurs, this is a quote from, the, from the, the dinosaur park in Utah, they're buried in a jumbled mass together with crocodiles, turtles, lizards, frogs, and clams. You just have to ask what type of catastrophe could bury 13 states of dinosaurs, 700,000 square miles, and bury them with crocodiles, turtles, lizards, frogs, and clams. Had to be a worldwide catastrophe. Here's uh, based on Dr. Clary's work where the dinosaur peninsula was. So we've got a lot of dinosaur trackways in this area. That was the last high ground before the final stage of the flood during the Zuni uh, stage buried everything. And that makes up the, the majority of the fossil evidence that we have today. When you go around and look at secular museum signs in these areas, I find it fascinating that most, if not all of them, admit that the dinosaurs are buried there from a massive watery catastrophe. Things like hundreds of dinosaurs buried together um, with shark teeth, or you know, they always talk about some massive watery inundation, which is exactly what fits the data. Another very convincing thing that this happened quickly and recently is the peer-reviewed scientific science uh, journals uh, not creationist publications, but these are peer-reviewed secular science journals that have now uh, accumulated and reported 16 different types of dinosaur organic biological material. Things like uh, FEX, histones, proteins, collagen, blood vessels, blood cells, cartilage, collagen, all these things that belong organically to dinosaurs that had to be entombed recently ca and, and catastrophically. Here is a clip from the Is Genesis History uh, uh, video showing Dr. Uh, Dr. Mark Armitage stretching out this flexible dinosaur horn from a triceratops. He can grab his, his forceps and, and uh, uh, different tools there and stretch, stretch it apart. You can see how stretchable this material is. Certainly doesn't look like 65 mil, million year old material to me. So there's really two different ways of looking at this. The question is, how did these 13 states get filled with millions of dead things that are found on both land creatures and marine creatures get buried and mixed together? The one hypothesis would be, well, slowly over millions of years. And the other hypothesis that we're advocating here is that it happened rapidly over a year period. Here's a video that was on National Geographic showing the subducting Farallon plate that was responsible for the Laramide orogeny. This is from Dr. Paul Heller and some of his colleagues that showed when the Farallon plate subducted under the North American continent, they say it was like a spatula sliding under an undercooked pancake. When it did that, it caused a lot of these mountains to rapidly rise up, which were involved in catastrophically killing the dinosaurs. And here we can use uh, underground radar and show that the Farallon plate subducted. We see the, the different temperature ranges of this Farallon plate that subducted, showing that it was an event that happened in the different stages that we believe it happened in. The question is, how could these dinosaurs 
have died off over millions of years when this Farallon plate was slowly and gradually just kind of cruising underneath North America uneventfully. It certainly couldn't have done that because if it was moving under the North American continent drastically enough to push up the Laramide orogeny with all these mountains being pushed and bubbled up, it had to happen quickly. And it was involved in rolling the, a huge amount of this earth, I guess is the only way to say it, with North America, where it's catastrophically involved in killing the dinosaurs. So it was a process that happened quickly. You can't have these dinosaurs living peacefully for 25 million years just cruising around while the oceanic plates are subducting with widespread volcanism occurring. That's why these dinosaurs are, built in, uh, are buried in both ash, mud, and sand. It's because the ash from all these volcanoes was being pushed up at the same time. The Farallon plate was subducting, creating huge cataclysmic power, burying these dinosaurs, and the ash came down over the top of them along with mud and tsunamis and buried them in the exact taphonomy that we see today. So here we have 13, you know, 13, 13 or 14 states, three partial countries over a million square miles, 1,800 miles long. It's a huge, massive dinosaur kill zone. And then we have the Dinosaur Peninsula where they made their last stand before the last stages of the flood inundated and buried them. So, well, what do evolutionists say about this? The evolutionists say, well, these dinosaurs died, you know, from the, from the asteroid that came and hit the Chicxulub uh, Peninsula in Mexico. This one big asteroid came there and fell. Well, Okay, if, if that's the case and you have one asteroid that's responsible for the whole demise of the dinosaur, how does that fit then? Because here we have where it would have landed and we have the effects from the water that would have pushed back and the tsunamis that would have pushed back from this one asteroid hitting in one location. It does nothing to come up and closely hit that 1,800 mile long stretch of a kill zone. Maybe it touches the bottom southern parts, but it certainly can't explain how you have 13 states filled with di dead dinosaurs in the middle of America. If we have an asteroid land here at the Chicxulub uh, Peninsula, how in the world is that impact, which is simulated here, supposed to go up and be responsible for for killing and burying 13 states worth of dinosaurs in this type of sediment. Uh, this is a, a clip showing uh, you know, what it must have looked like when the water's coming up from subduction-related tsunamis, not from an asteroid. The asteroid uh, ex explanation simply does not make sense. The only way you can bury that 13 state regions uh, filled fill with dead dinosaurs is to bring the ocean up on land catastrophically. That's the only way you can bury the entire family of hadrosaurs. We can see the Jurassic layers that are buried, followed by the Cretaceous layers that were buried next. We have the dinosaurs that are found in the downslopes of these Cretaceous areas. And we have the entire dinosaur family buried along both sides of this shelf, and we have a lot of them buried along the dinosaur peninsula there. We have all the T-Rexes or all the Allosauruses that, that are buried there in the Jurassic. The sauropods are buried in this zone. The stegosaurus are, are buried in this zone. You can plot them all out. They also happen to be living in the same regions when they were catastrophically buried. Pterosaurs are interesting because they could fly. They're found in all three sections of strata. They're found in the Triassic uh, strata. They're found in the Jurassic and they're found in the Cretaceous because they could fly and get away from a lot of this craziness that was going on before they eventually bought it and had to get buried. But they're found all buried throughout the entire Meso Mesozoic strata. We can see here there's the Cretaceous layers that they're buried in and then in the uh, Jurassic areas that we find those same types of creatures. So one question would be this, does it make more sense that all the dinosaurs died during the same one year flood while living in different habitats or that they died out in the same areas with those same little circle bubble fly ends uh, over a 180 million year period, all buried in ash, mud, sand with marine life. These creatures were smart. They could have survived. Something happened that overwhelmed them all buried them together in the same area. You think about America today, well, during the 1800s, there were between 50 and 60 million buffalo roaming around America. Where are they now? 
they're gone. Where are their fossils? They're not preserved because there wasn't a flood to do it. So we can go from millions and millions and millions of buffalo roaming around the North American continent to almost no trace of them because there wasn't a flood to preserve them. The reason why we have a 13 state region of dead dinosaurs in the middle of America is because there was a catastrophic process that buried them all. Here's a couple of just extra tidbits that I found fascinating. This is a book from John Horner uh, called Digging Dinosaurs. The subtitle of this book is The Search That Unraveled the Mystery of the Baby Dinosaurs. This is a kill zone, a dinosaur kill zone in Montana, where he, John says we had one huge bed of myasaurus bones stretching 1.25 miles east to west. So imagine this. There's a stretch a mile and a quarter long with dead myasaurus dinosaurs, but what they found in this 30 million fossil collection was the tomb of 10,000 adult myasaurus dinosaurs. In this entire collection, they didn't find a single fossil specimen of anything that was juvenile or baby. The adults sensing and, and or seeing that Noah's flood was coming, the entire herd of 10,000 bolted and ran for higher ground, leaving behind everything else that couldn't keep up. John says, how could any mudslide, no matter how catastrophic, have the force to take a two or three ton animal that had just died and smash it around so much that its femur, still embedded in the flesh of its thigh, could split lengthwise? So he's looking at the taphonomy and the burial conditions and the, the burial nature of these bones saying, wow, some type of worldwide blender hit these bones, killed 10,000 adults all together, blended them together and buried them in an emplacement that they can go dig up today. 10,000 adult myasaura, all 10,000 were between nine and 23 feet long. Not a single baby or juvenile was found. Sounds like a worldwide flood. Another thing I found very interesting is during the Tejas stage or the retreating stage of the flood, there was a great amount of she the water sheeting and planing off of the continents that left these submarine canyons. If you take a tour down the west coast of America, uh, on even Google Earth, you can see these huge underwater channels and, and canyons that were carved out. These are, these are even bigger than the Grand Canyon that were carved out by rapidly rushing water as the, as the continents were tilting back, breeding all the water in sheet flow off of the continents, chiseling through and creating these huge underwater canyons on both sides of America. It's just very clear evidence of water sheeting off of the continent. So in summary, we have over a million square miles that are filled with billions of land, land and sea creatures buried together in ash, mud, and sand layers that killed them. Soft tissues and dinosaurs uh, reveals rapid and recent burial. We have rapid catastrophic uplift that was involved due to subducting oceanic plates. Widespread massive volcanism uh, that buried the creatures in ash while the subduction was happening. It wasn't an afterthought, it happened when it was happening and it, they're buried in this very ash that killed them. We have folded and geologically bent strata and massive submarine canyons on both coasts. These are five or six of the key highlights I think that are quite convincing about Noah's flood. There are a lot more, but these are some ones that I found quite interesting. I want to sum up uh, and end by this by sharing a, a quick story. My daughter and I and son uh, went to the Dinosaur Provincial Park up in Canada. We we're at this outside museum exhibit. It was probably 110 degrees out there. And we're looking at this dead buried Edmontosaurus, a duckbill dinosaur. It's covered in, by this plexiglass structure. And it was just me and my daughter and, and, and my son. And there was a dad there with his son, maybe 10 years old. And the son and the dad came up and pushed the button on the museum audio tape that supposedly explained how this creature got here. And the museum tape said something like, well, millions of years ago, this creature came to a tropical flood. It was involved in a tropical flood and the creek turned into a river and the river overflowed its banks. And one by one, these animals tried swimming for it and couldn't make it to the other side and then drowned. And my daughter, Michaela, just had an epiphany. And she 
almost embarrassingly got really loud in front of this dad and the son and said, are they, they've got to be kidding me. She says, as far as I can see for miles, there are these buried hoodoos that are filled with dinosaurs from over 30 different species and they're buried with birds and fish and clams and oysters as far as I can see. And they're saying it was a tropical storm when a number of these creatures are 50 feet under the mud. How much higher would the ocean have to be to bring 50 feet of mud on top of these creatures and bury them as far as my eye can see? In fact, it's a 14 mile stretch filled with over 30 different species of dinosaurs buried with mud, fish, clams, the whole works. So she has her epiphany. She has her, oh my gosh, Noah's flood is real moment right in front of this dad and, the, and, and his son. And it was almost a little bit embarrassing because the louder she got, the, the dad come was getting close to me and he was obviously eavesdropping. We're the only people out there. It was 110 degrees. And so I'm like, yeah, Michaela, wow, that's the same epiphany I had a few months ago, but I'm glad you had it now. We recovered from that. <clears throat> We're walking back inside and she said, Dad, it's so hot. I'm going to go in and get an ice cream. And I said, that's fine. I'm going to go, go to straight to the car, turn on the air conditioning, and I'll, I'll come pull you up. On my way out to the car, the dad walked uh, diagonally over in the parking lot and kind of intercepted me. And I said, oh, my gosh, here, here we go. I'm thinking inside, one, one more hostile atheist conversation. What's he going to say? And he was real respectful. And he says, sir, do you have a minute? I said, of course, go, go ahead. And he says, look. I listened to everything your daughter said out at that out, out, outdoor exhibit. He said, I'm a licensed geologist. I've been steeped in evolutionary training about strata, geology, taphonomy, the whole works. And then he said, in five minutes after listening to your daughter, I have completely changed my mind. He said, her explanation of what we can see there with that 14 mile stretch of dead dinosaurs buried with fish and birds and clams, makes more sense and better explains the evidence and everything I learned while getting my, ge my geology license. And he said, you know what? I used to be a Christian. Then I went to school and got my degree in geology and kind of just let go of my biblical perspectives. But I'm going to come back to him because I have a lot of unlearning to do. And strangely, I bumped into him the next day at the Royal Terrell Museum. He happened to be behind me. It's kind of like we had some, some more divine encounters there. But it was incredible hearing that in five minutes, this licensed geologist had completely renounced his evolutionary worldview and adopted a biblical worldview because the evidence plainly lined up to the most obvious conclusion that these creatures were rapidly buried in a flood. Mm -hmm.